Hello, everybody. It is great to see you today. I have a really genuine, wonderful person connected uh, to the show. I was just looking over at our comment section. We have live commenting, so make sure that you share, you like, but you also comment. Ask us questions because now is your time for some free advice or free information. So why not? And I absolutely love everybody who watches the show. So make sure that you go to YouTube, the Caffeinated Cooper Show channel, and ring that bell because we do have some special promotions coming up to where I will have some new things to send out. I hope everybody who signed up for the Christmas card that they enjoyed their holiday gifts because it was much more than uh, just a Christmas card. And I love doing that. I love giving back because you give me so much over this past seven years. As you can see, it is season seven. All right, everybody. I want to give a shout out to the very first sponsor when I wrote all those sponsor letters. And I'm like, yeah, I know you don't know who I am, but it's worth it. And uh, they gave me a wonderful interview. So Eric Elfstrom is one of the founders of Pure Lift and Pure Lift is clean caffeine. That is their, um, their registered trademark, clean caffeine. It's zero calories, all natural, nothing artificial, easy to use and made in the USA. So it's this little stick here and it has um, clean caffeine. It is sourced from the green coffee bean, I believe. So yes, clean caffeine from unroasted green coffee beans, a hint less than one milligram of stevia and vitamins A and B complex. The unique portable energy stick can be stirred into your drink of choice, including but certainly not limited to water, juice, soda, adult beverages, and they come in. So this one is the lime. I have berry and I have orange. And then there's another one um, that I do have in my drawer. I just didn't grab it. It is taste free, taste free. Everybody thinks, okay, you know, caffeine, caffeine additives, it has that tart that, you know, it's, it's sort of like the rind of an orange that you feel like you're eating. That's not what this is. It truly is taste free. Now you can purchase these at Best Buy, Home Depot, Amazon, and purelift.com. That's P-U-R-E-L-Y-F-T.com. They are offering free shipping for the new year, 2023. Don't you remember being a kid, you know, watching the Jetsons? 2023. Ah, oh, that sounded so long ago. Here we are. Where's my flying car? right? Okay, everybody. I would love to introduce our guest that's connected with us. Hello, Joe Mathis. It's wonderful to see you, a regular viewer of the show. I absolutely love you. So make sure you stay tuned in because if you have a dog in your life, like I do, he is truly like another child. But I say that in his perspective because my boxer is so human-like, but he's kind of so much better. I feel bad about saying that, but he's so compassionate and he wants to cuddle and he's just a wonderful guy. So anyway, if you have a canine in your life, you've got to stay tuned because I have Ryan Matthews, a decorated veteran, began his dog training career in 2002 in the U.S., Army training and handling elite military working dogs, MWDs, with his beloved trainees. Ryan performed bite protection, bomb threat sweeps, secret service missions, and combat deployment to Iraq with Army canine Zito. He successfully worked with Special Forces, Army SWAT, and infantry units 
with his trained companion, Zito, who ultimately saved lives over their period of ser service. At his peak, Ryan was training, you won't believe this, 10 dogs in person per day, which was exhausting. And he struggled to find balance in his life because he truly loved what he was doing. But that constant grind ultimately cost him his health. And he knew he needed to find a way to still provide the same amazing service to his clients while also focusing on staying healthy, mind, body, and spirit. And that is that copy right there is straight off his website, worldofdogtraining.com. Without any further ado, let's welcome Mr. Ryan Matthews. Hello, Ryan. How are you? Hi, Elizabeth. I'm doing great. I'm really happy to be here. I am so happy that you have some time for us because you're a really, really busy guy. And I think we were connected through a couple of mutuals and I found you and I was like, oh my gosh, I have got to find out what his story is. How did you become who you are today? Which is like, that's a huge boulder of a question. If you just listen to the, the bio, like my goodness. So you're a veteran. I, I want to say on camera, thank you very much for your service. You're worth it. Oh, I love that. Did you guys hear that? I said that to you in the green room yeah. and you said you're worth it. Wow. That, that is the best. Mm. I mean, compliment to a compliment. Right. So thank you. That really shows just how much you care in your everyday life. And I really do appreciate you. Mm. Um, okay. So let's just begin with where and when did your love of dogs begin? Mm. Well, the, the, the direct answer is on a deployment to Raika, Croatia. That was when I knew that I wanted to work with military working dogs. But it was really my love for animals that prompted my love for dogs. And the love for animals was really very special to me. And it was something that I didn't really give much thought at the time. And it was where my mom had taken me to go and visit, of all things, a horse, mm -hmm. a horse that was on someone's property. And we would just go and we would just be with that horse. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know like how impactful that would have been in that time. Uh, but that horse opened me up to my love for animals. And um, that's how it all started. But then again, knowing that I wanted to work with dogs, that was like in 2000. And one, when I saw these military working dog handlers doing the bite work with their dogs, it looked so cool. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, that's exactly what I want to do. And I interviewed the gentlemen that were the handlers and talked about, you know, how do you do so? And uh, that's that's how I discovered it. And then next, you know, a year later, I was actually going to school in uh, Department of Defense military working dog handlers course in San Antonio, Texas, and um, made that dream a reality. Oh my goodness. Wow. What was the horse's name? You know, I don't know. We never even met the people that owned it. And oh, wow. what I could tell you, the energy exchange was just absolutely incredible. Like I can feel it to this day right now. I can relive it. And I was like, I think like two years old. I was very little. And um, horses are also very special. Of course, I'm gifted with dogs. The horses are very special energetically, and they're very, very sensitive. And the beautiful thing about horses is they show you who you are in that moment. So they'll avoid you if your energy is not right, or they'll check you. Maybe they'll nip you. Maybe they'll put their lip on you, on you and people think it's cute. It's like, no, the, the horse is like, hey, come correct to me. Uh, and, and dogs are a lot different in that way, but there are some similarities. Very interesting. Okay. All right. So when your training began, I read here in 2002, but when did you enlist with the army? Mm. I enlisted in the army in March of 2000, a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. So you were pretty new. I mean, that was only two years in. And then you began working with canines. How how did you find your way 
to that path of being like, I want to work with dogs? Well, it was really seeing those handlers working with those dogs, but I had a real, I had an advantage. You know, I went into the army as military police and it was because the things that I was doing as a teenager weren't really that great. I wasn't being a, let's just say, productive member of society. And I knew that I needed some type of discipline. I wanted to change who I was, but I didn't know how to get there. And so I decided to join the army to really clean my act up, if you will. And so I joined as military police. I figured, you know, if you're police, you got to do the right thing and, and all of that stuff. Well, within six months of my first duty station in Mannheim, Germany, I found myself under investigation. Now, the stuff that was alleged wasn't true. They said I was a part of something. It wasn't true. But nonetheless, I had this dream and I, I certainly wasn't living it. And um, what ended up happening is I ended up being the driver for the colonel of all things. So you would think that would be a punishment, but it ended up to be a gift because that colonel ended up to become like a father figure to me. Wow. And so my, when my time with driving for the colonel was done, he said, Matthews, what do you want to do now? I was like, I want to be a dog handler. And so he put me in for it. And so that was it. That was a huge gift. And I think that's the interesting thing about life, right? It's like we can get there, but which path takes us to wherever uh, is yet to be determined. And so, you know, I took kind of an interesting path to be able to work with dogs. But I think all of those sequential, sequential events were kind of necessary to, to be able to do so. Sure. So I have a question just about enlistment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm, I'm an ex-wife to uh, someone who is in the Navy. So he's a Navy veteran. And I have so many friends that are in the military. A lot of them, I would say a large percent of who I know, um, they were either living in a part of the country where it was a struggle to try to begin your adult life. Um, they had things in their past that they were trying to work out, things like that. Do they know your background when you enlist or is everybody, is it just a clean slate for everybody and everybody's their own man at that point? They'll ask you, yeah, they'll essentially find out what type of man or woman you are and there's an interview process, if you will. But we're all pretty young for the most part. And so we've only been through so much life, right? Mm -hmm. However, and I love one of the things I'm most passionate about, I say is pets and vets, right? Dogs and vets are my thing. At the same time, I'm going to be real with my observation of my brothers and sisters of arms. A lot of us going in, we got some baggage. It's just what I've seen time and time again. And it's been my truth for sure. Interesting. Yeah. And for me, my truth was I was running away from something. Mm -hmm. Well, I think a lot of us do that, right? But everybody, uh, to different degrees, you know, there, there's different situations and different degrees. But all right. So now you get your chance in 2002 yeah. to start working with the dogs. Yeah. What was the first um, thing you noticed that you loved? And what was your Achilles heel? Mm. That's a really great question. <laughs> well, thank you. It was probably the same answer. And that was fear. It was the thing that held me back and the thing that I also loved. Because that fear, that excitement, because, I mean, we would essentially put a harness on a dog so that it could pull. We use this uh, special back tie and tie the dog to a tree. And then we do, it sounds bad, but we do what's called agitating or call it flirting with the dog. And we get the dog to feel like it wants to be protective. And that's how we start to train a dog to attack. It starts very, um, very fun fundamentals and gradually building. And that's scary. I mean, it's like, what if the dog gets loose from this thing? And, and when it's snapping and all this stuff and you're wanting that, you don't really yet have the the muscle memory built in and know how to read the dog fast enough and everything happens very quickly. And so that was something that I was afraid of, but I kind of liked it because it was very exciting. I mean, I was 20 something then and, you know, definitely like a lot of uh, high adrenaline type of things, certainly in my twenties. 
And so, yeah, that fear of the unknown of, is that dog going to bite me? The fear of, and can I do this? I mean, really, I've never put in these words before, but training these, these weapons, if you will, these mm -hmm. working dogs, the, the dogs really took us under their wings, if you will, because we were not initially equipped to even handle them. Mm. You have these very powerful beings that we're training to be these weapons, but we are still trying to figure out ourselves on how to be a handler. And so that's a really tricky thing to navigate. And eventually, hopefully, with a lot of repetitions and a lot of effort and attention to detail and a lot of desire and, and caring, then you gradually start to figure it out. Wow. Wow. Interesting. A dog's learning from you and you're learning from the dog. Yeah. And then yeah. to this day, Elizabeth, working with the public, I see, and just my own dog, my dog teaches me more than any human. Very interesting. Sure. Yeah. You know, they don't have all the social filters and things that we teach each other, our children sometimes. Oh, there's my dog. Yeah, you. Um, <laughs> you know, and it's like you put all these filters on it and then people, they're, they don't know how to express themselves. So um, German Shepherds, are is that the main breed that you're working with at that point in time? It was. You can see the dog behind me. That's my dog, Zeus. And he's a Belgian Malinois, which people tend to think is a German Shepherd. Yeah. Um, so now they're... They're tending to use more labs in Belgian Malinois. Uh, when I was in, it was a mix of German Shepherds and Belgian Malinois. And now they're starting to use more labs. Um, and there's different reasons for, for all of those decisions. But yeah, overall, they're definitely using working dogs. Um, and that's specifically military. Civilians do it a little bit differently. So I do have a question about the labs in the military. Would that be more for uh, a scent for the dog that has very, very fine scent? Exactly. So what I was kind of, you must have picked up on it. What I was alluding to was like our shepherds and our Belgian Malinois are what we call dual purpose. Mm -hmm. So that means they have obviously two purposes. One is to use their nose and detect usually narcotics or explosives, one or the other, never both. That would be confusing. When the dog sits, is it sitting for drugs or a bomb? Do you call the explosive ordinance disposal or do you call the, the <laughs> army FBI, right? So one or the other. And then the other part is train to attack, right? We call it patrol mm -hmm. uh, but versus using the labs. The labs, we do not train protection, not train to bite, not train to uh, go and, and bite someone and pull them down, if you will, if they run away. The labs are used just simply for their detection, and they're um, a bit more sound, if you will. You're not too concerned about the lab being out at an uh, airport or doing a Secret Service mission with a lot of whatever around. Uh, it's less liability and less bite accidents versus the Malinois and the Shepherds. They've been started to become bred to, to bite. Um, on purpose as protection, security, that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I do have a question. Um, I've noticed, especially when I'm flying into LAX, there's there's a lot of Malinois or uh, German Shepherds. I have to say, I, I can't tell the difference, um, but they are, you know, sniffing around. I'm assuming they're sniffing not so much for bomb detection or flammables or things like that. It's going to be more of drug smuggling, I'm assuming. Right. But when the dog is training to pick up on that scent, do they train with, I mean, would you have to use the drugs to, how else would they get that scent, right? Right. How does that work? Well, I can't comment too much on what they are, trained for at the airport as that's not something I've done professionally, but I have people in the industry and especially since September 11th, you do find more explosive detection dogs in the airports. It's more of a, more of a threat. Um, but you know, the, what's so interesting about how dogs can uh, decipher scent and, and I'll just, I'll say this cause I think it's interesting and I hope you, you and your audience find it intriguing as well. If we think about the aroma of a pizza, Right. So just think about what that smells like to you. It's it's likely one smell. Right. That's how you you process it in your brain. 
Well, now the dog doesn't smell it that way. The dog will actually differentiate every single ingredient. That means the pepperoni is separate from cheese, separate from sauce, separate from the crust. It can decipher all of these different ingredients, which I think is just super interesting. We got about 20 million olfactory senses. Dogs have about 200 million olfactory senses. Mm. Really, really interesting. Um, but essentially, again, whether they're searching for narcotics, explosive, cell phones, and a prison system, uh, diabetes, cancer alert, something like that. It doesn't matter what the dog is trained to do. The dog doesn't care. The dog just cares about getting its reward. <laughs> it doesn't know that it's saving lives. It doesn't know it's busting people or anything else like that. Nope. It's just like having the dog has a neuro association of when I smell this, if I sit or do the desired response, I get what I want. Mm -hmm. Like that's simply put, that's how it works. And so we leverage what the dog is motivated by, which is why we will very selective on who will make the cut to be hmm. a working dog. Very interesting. All right. And then what about um, now, right now you're working with celebrities and doing training as well as training people to become their own trainer exactly. under your fan your franchise. Um, so we'll go to your website in just a minute, but, I, you know, we were talking about a video that caught my interest yeah. on Instagram and I'd love to be able to show it to the audience because I have a couple of questions and was this just before we show it, it's um, you're on a street corner, essentially. Were you working with someone you already knew or was this a stranger? No, I did not know this person. Uh, if it's the one that I think of, Let's see here. Actually, yeah, if, if you don't mind, can you pull up and then I can say what it is? The one, yeah. how to hold your presence? Yes, yes. Okay, very good. So what you're observing in this video is essentially uh, KJ Prince. He's the new owner of World of Dog Training, Nashville, Tennessee. Oh. He came for me to train him two weeks hands-on, in person. And um, we had asked for people to want to receive some free dog training. We wanted people that had never been to training with their dog before and unruly dogs. And so this was my first time meeting this person ever. And um, so what you're seeing is two things. One, how I interact with the public, with uh, their pet dogs. And number two, part of how I, part of like an inside, if you will, of my train the trainer school, where I train people to be their own dog trainer like I do, but in their respective town or cities. So that's okay. what that is. All right, let's take a watch. What I want you to do is hold your presence. Can I have one? Watch. So she's not, she's not like, shh, stop. That's my girl. She's not taking you seriously. Yeah. Okay. So, shh. so this leg needs to move into her when she does that. Yeah, like that. Yes. Right. That's good. You're not kicking her. Shh. Down. Good. Instead of let go, instead of down, we want to say off or no, because down is for lay down. Got it. The other thing that you're going to do when a dog, dog jumps up, pops up, is you can pop the leash straight down towards the ground. Yeah, dog's coming up, pop leash down. He's also jumping up because the <laughs> leash is coming it. up and right. you're pulling her up a little bit, yeah? So, so the right leg into her. See how I just moved her? Mm -hmm. So don't hide, you're rolling away and the right foot into dog. Nice job, a little less. Okay. Relax that. There, better. Hold your presence, hold your, yes, hold your presence. Good. You're gonna roll the wrist only, okay? Then you're gonna walk through her. What I want you to do is hold your presence. Can I have one? That's really fantastic. The first thing that struck me was the word down. Uh-huh. And it seems so commonly used. I've yeah. On it i'm not going to be doing it anymore but lay down so you want to say off for them to lower themselves it's yes absolutely now it's not always about the word you could use numbers what it is about is communication just like in our relationships with our family and our significant others we want our communication clean and consistent and precise now when it's not consistent and what i mean is 
my communication doesn't change because I'm feeling super emotional. My communication doesn't change because I'm in a bad mood. My communication doesn't change because I'm in an overly good mood. We are supposed to be our dog's leaders, and dogs do not follow an emotional leader. Right? That doesn't feel safe. Right? And just like in a relationship again with people, how do we further connect? Through being heard, being seen, feeling safe. So you want to do the same thing with your animal. Okay. And so again, it's not always about what you say. It's about, and this is going to really hit home. It's how you say it. Right. 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 Okay. That, you know, that's bringing it together. When we adopted our family dog that we have now, he's a boxer, adopted him as a puppy. Um, I immediately got a trainer in the house. And, you know, there were a lot of puppy things. There was bad communication because there's seven people in our house oh, wow. and wow. everybody wants to say something different. And I'm like, mm, that, this can't be right. And that was an amazing reality because she showed us uh, a different octaves of our voice that makes a huge difference. Wow. Okay, so I mean that's fantastic. All right, I gotta ask you, how many dogs do you have right now, personally? Well, geez, you know I travel so much that yeah. I currently just have one dog, the the one you see behind me, and that's Zeus. Oh, okay. So Ryan just fell off for just a moment. I'm sure he will reconnect. Um, so we'll see him in just a moment. And while he is reconnecting, let's do this. Let's go over to his website, which is exactly where we were headed because he has a really amazing website and he's doing something here. He has franchised what he does and he's going to come back on and tell us all about that. So it's World of Dog Training with Ryan Matthews and he is a canine mentalist. That is something else that, oh, here he is. Ryan Matthews, how are you doing? Oh, all right, hold on. <laughs> no, I thought we had him, but he just popped right back off. So he'll come back on in just a moment. Let's scroll around through his website here. And you can see he has some really great publicity. Um, he has been on TED Talks, Good Morning Britain, CBS 8, uh, San Diego News 9, Lifestyle Ma Magazine. And this is where we were going next. So DIY Dog Training School is offered on his website as well as Canine Mentalist and World of Dog Training one-on-one -on -one lessons. So let's see, here he is. Ryan Matthews is back with us. This happens very often where, you know, live is live. We have technical issues once in a while. So I was just cruising around in your website mm. and I wanted to go over the canine mentalist. Mm, yeah, I love it. Thank you. Okay, of course. Hopefully from us reviewing that last video clip, you were able to see a piece of what canine mentalist is. And canine mentalist is essentially where I teach people to speak dog without ever saying a word, hmm. right? It's, yeah. you hear of like the dog whisper, right? Well, that's my version of the dog whisper. And to me, canine mentalist means having the deepest possible connection you can with your dog. It means talking without ever saying a word. It's honoring your animal and who they are and what they need. I love that. You know, talking without ever saying a word. When my puppy is acting a way that he shouldn't be, maybe he's being too, uh, too um, what's the word? Pest is what's coming to my mind, but that's not right. Opportunistic. Let's, how about that? Okay. Opportunistic. So when we have a guest over and he's getting a little too close, He's looking for a little bit too much attention from the guest. I will make eye contact with him. Okay. And the eye contact now, my motive here, and I don't know if I'm doing this right or not, Ryan. My motive is to be alpha. Okay. 
So I'm trying to tell him he needs to stand down, essentially. And I will make eye contact with him until he breaks that eye contact from me. Is that right? Well, when you ask, is that right? Just know this. There's more than one way to get the end result done when it comes to training a dog. And really, let's get rid of, say, training a dog. And let's just think of it as capturing behavior, getting behavior, molding behavior, creating good uh, habitual uh, behavioral patterns. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's more than one way to get there. And this is, again, where you honor who you are and you honor your animal as it relates to your approach. But overall, in training thousands of dogs, what I've discovered is there's a system. And the system, I call it like 3D learning, right? And so this 3D learning is about, number one, your leadership. Because you were saying you want to be the alpha, and part of being alpha is being the leader. This, okay. right? Because that's how it is in professional settings and yada, yada. Right. right. We look to our leader as the guide, the mentor, or what, however you want to say that. And so that means that your dog needs to look to you for what should I do? But if your dog is just taking it upon themselves, then they're not looking at you as the leader. The dog is saying, hey, hey, mom and dad, I got this under control. You can hang out back there. I'll take care of it. And the dog's not seeing you as the leader. Now, you don't just get to be the leader because you want it. You get to be the leader through your actions, through your consistency, through your fairness, through being reliable, okay, and through your energy and through reward and through correction as well, balance. And so, again, leadership is a huge part of it. And then also your energy. So are you putting out the energy and the confidence of a strong leader? In the video, you saw how I just demanded my space. It's called spatial pressure. It's very alive in our Western culture. When I was overseas in Korea, when I was in the army, spatial pressure doesn't work so well because people are very comfortable being very close. Mm -hmm. In Western culture, very easy to maintain that three foot bubble, if you will. But now as we get closer, people back up. Well, guess what? So do dogs. So again, this is, part of leadership and also part of energy. And so the energy we want to put out there is of confidence, of calmness and being in your power. That's why the video is talking about your presence. Now that only does this work with dogs, but this is about us being powerful beings with, within ourselves, empowered, inspired beings that have self-respect and self-love and show up in the world with certainty and confidence and ready to go and be of service, right? And so to me, it's very intriguing how all this stuff comes back full circle, right? And we think, oh, it's just dog training. Well, I can just be that, but I like it to be so much more. That really, that puts, you're breaking the fourth wall, right? So to say, in what you just said. And it's like, yeah, you're right. You're right. I'm expecting to be the leader because I'm human or I'm taller than him. Yeah. Or I'm providing the house and the food and the water, but right. wow. Okay. I'm going to be doing some things differently. So with the, um, become a dog trainer, Yes. how does this course work as far as the time involvement? Mm -hmm. Um, I know that you're in Southern California, beautiful Southern California, which I miss dearly. Um, did we need to be in that area or can we do it virtually? How, how does that work? Yes to all of the above, essentially. Uh, but let's let's talk about what it looks like. And I'll just I'll just lead with this. We could even do it in Costa Rica or Bali. Okay. So essentially, we're gonna work together for four weeks. The first week is virtual. That's where I'm like your business coach, if you will. I'm going over marketing. I'm going over sales. I'm going over how to create your custom packages and also the lifestyle that you want to live. I'm helping you cater and create your business to match the lifestyle you want to live for yourself and or with your family. Okay. So that's a lot of what the first week is. I, and I have, I don't want to overwhelm you, but I have like 200 videos for people to watch and I have a 200 page workbook. So there's a lot of support and a lot of resources after that first virtual week, which we could do anywhere, do it from your home. The second and third week are, we need to be in person. And I do this in groups of five only 
for high quality type of experience. Now, the beauty of being in person is obviously I get to watch your every motion, every movement and coach you. You'll be filmed and we'll analyze the, the footage. Your battle buddy, which you'll be teamed up with, will take pictures and videos of you and you'll do for them. And, and you have just a lot of support. And so you'll work with 20 dogs hands on for those second and third weeks in person, hands on. Again, we could do this in Southern California, Bali or Costa Rica. Uh, Costa Rica and Bali are things I'm currently building out. And then after the third week, by the way, hopefully you've went ahead and, and signed up and started to do some marketing. And if, if so, I connect you to a marketer that gets you 50 to 100 leads per month. And so my goal is to hold your hand on booking your in-person uh, meetings with potential clients before you even go back home. And so there's a one month gap between your third and your fourth week. So you can just get out there and go get it, give it a try. Then your fourth week goes back to virtual at your hometown or wherever you are. And I'm hearing what's going well and most importantly, what's not. And I'm helping tweak things. I'm helping with the role playing of the sales and that kind of stuff. And so it's ultimately four weeks, but it ends up being 60 days because there's a, a one month gap of you just getting out there and trying it for yourself. Wow. I mean, you cover all bases there. That's, I mean, that's really something else. It's sort of like, you know, going for a college degree and before you graduate, you already have a job. Well, well, thank you for the acknowledging that because, you know, I bought into a franchise many years ago when I got into pet dog training in 2008. And so what I've really done, Elizabeth, is I've looked at like, well, where are the gaps in my industry? And one of the gaps is there's not enough support. And so the other part is once they graduate, and I certify them under the World of Dog Training System, we have monthly meetings, and those are recorded on Zoom. And in fact, we just had one earlier today. Oh. And we call it, I call it business breakthroughs. And so we're talking about what's going well and also what's not. And we're just addressing it. And so, for example, one of the cases today was this person had signed up for a networking event, and he's like, I don't know how to do my elevator pitch. Well, we did it right there with him. And so that would be one example. And then mid-month, we do um, smooth selling is what those ones are called. And so we do role playing. We go over sales scripts. And because, you know, here's the thing. We really need to get good at selling. And it's not so that we can sell the people. It's so that we can be of service to people and we can help them get out of their own way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's how I reframe it. And I think it's just so, it's so important. The more people we can reach, the larger impact we can have, the more dogs we can help, and the more we can improve the quality of life of pet owners and their dogs. So what about the process of finding the right client? I can imagine that not everybody who owns a dog it really has the correct mindset or atmosphere or energy to be the right client. So how do you navigate that? It's a really high level question. I appreciate it. Well, that also came in up our meeting today. Now, to be fair, you know, I've been in the working with dogs for 20 years. And so my perspective has changed over the years. You had talked about earlier, and I think it was the intro, that I was working with like 10 dogs a day, 10 clients a day. And that's when I was sure I was making really good money, but I was taking everyone. And you know what I wasn't? I was honoring them, but I wasn't honoring myself. Mm -hmm. And after having cancer and heart attack and many near-death things, you know, I began to really look at, What's of greatest service to me? And so I became very selective. So now I actually have an interview process. And the reason why is I look at life differently now after facing some near-death things. I look at how I spend my time and does it feed my heart? Does it feed my mind? Does it feed my soul? Or does it feed me financially? And if it doesn't do that, I'm not really interested in doing it. And that's just because I know I could be taken like that. Really. And so what I look for is to interview clients and I want them to interview me and I look for alignment. I look for it to feel like a dance, if you will, over the phone. Mm -hmm. And so I won't just meet up with someone. I interview them over the phone as hopefully they do as well. And I'll be honest with you in doing this for so long, I can tell in the first five seconds if I want to work with someone or not. You can, you can feel who they are over the phone. In fact, Again, I'm kind of aging myself, dating myself, but I can I can often guess what they do professionally. Very interesting. Yeah. 
Wow. Well, I mean, you're describing such a deep level of the essence of life mm. to know where your energy balance is and be able to work with dogs, which which you've informed all of us about how much it is about your where your mind is, your energy, yes. um, purpose, purpose for adopting a dog. And, you know, when I was looking into all the amazing things that you are and you've done, and I thought, I really want him on the show. <laughs> so I remember chatting with you for a moment. I think it was through email. And one of the things I had said was so many times you hear about so-and-so got a puppy for Christmas or, you know, so-and-so got a rabbit for Easter or, you know, giving animals as a gift um, probably isn't advisable, but <laughs> what would you say to that family out there? If there's anything that comes to mind, um, you know, grandma gave our daughter a dog. Now what? Exactly. Think about what you're signing up for. Now to be fair to the public, they don't know what they don't know. Just like, I don't know whoever's listening to this, what they do with their profession and they would know way more than I would. But we do have a duty and a responsibility to that dog and to the family or whoever's going to receive it to be informed. And that way we can have the best life possible. But that's usually not how it plays out, right? Right. And um, so to me, that's, that's a big deal. And what we tend, to, I mean, look, we want to do what feels good in life, mm -hmm. right? That's how... Tony Robbins talks about pain and pleasure. Like that's how, that's how we operate as humans, right? Well, sure, we have the pleasure thing going on. But if we're not informed and we don't know how to handle this dog, the pain's going to start coming because you're going to lose sleep. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to start having the dog maybe destroy your house and be destructive. Now, I, I, don't, I don't share this to instill fear. I share this so that we can step up and be more informed and do more due diligence and know if we're setting ourselves up or these other people for failure. But when you plan it and you put forth the effort and the time, it can be a beautiful thing. But I, I will just say puppies are a lot of work. It's kind of like having a newborn all over again. It really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what if, um, you know, I'm trying to gather some good ideas and good suggestions for anybody out there that might be watching this and saying, we adopted a puppy. We thought it was a great idea. It, it's really not aligning with our life. Okay. Um, there are societies out there for training dogs for veterans. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't bring it to my mind. There's a large organization in uh, Florida, but would that be a good place to think about rehoming a puppy if you're really, truly just it's just not working. What could you say to that? That's a great question. I know who you're who you're speaking of. It's the Duval family. Actually, I met them when I was in Jacksonville years ago. I think it's um, Canine Warriors or something, yeah. weird, something like yes. that. Mm -hmm. And the logo is like someone using a cane or something like that with a prosthetics, if I remember correctly. I'm very visual. But to answer your question, sorry. Um, that's a really difficult you've asked some really great questions elizabeth today <laughs> you know really what we look for is temperament so what's the personality it's just like just like me do you want me to be doing your project manager type of task for your business elizabeth like the answer is absolutely not i'm a visionary yeah. i'm i can help you grow and scale and that i'm not the detailed person same thing with the dog what is that personality remember honoring the animal what is that personality of that dog? Would they enjoy the work? And so unfortunately, it's a case by case thing. But if the dog was, say, a good candidate, I think that that is a great idea. A lot of, uh, a lot of service dog organizations tend to have their own breeding program or they have their own source. So that would be a bit difficult. Mm. I definitely would say figure out where things went wrong with the dog, number one. And then after that, figure out who possesses the things that um, we're lacking. So for example, a common one is I'm like, you know, we may, we need to consider rehoming this dog. 
to a single person that maybe even feels a bit lonely mm-hmm. and the dog can get them out of the house and vice versa. So it's a win-win. Sure. And, and you know, be more active and this kind of thing. And um, they're already, you know, a leader and that kind of stuff, but they could use a little pick me up and they, they would enjoy getting out and about with the dog. And so, again, you just want to find the right fit. And so sometimes it's just best to um, post on social media or something like that. But I definitely, you know, I'm not into the whole go to a shelter thing unless it's a no-kill shelter. Uh, it's, It's very important. And the other part is this. Sometimes through just a little bit of understanding, like, for example, I get dogs off leash in four to five lessons. Like I could give someone in a month's time a brand new dog as long as the people will follow my system. And so I don't want to just jump to, oh, let's just rehome. I think that it's our duty to put forth the time, the effort, and maybe the money uh, to, to give it a give it an honest go. And I think that also feels cleaner within ourselves. Like, hey, we really gave it a try. It's just not a good fit. You know, speaking in lines with um, give it a good try. So you offer DIY dog training school through your website as well. Would you mind telling us a little bit more about what that is? Right. So that's like a whole bunch of videos that are three to five minutes long. It's essentially how I teach people in person. Okay. So the idea behind that is that not everybody can pay the $500 a lesson. And I wanted to make training affordable to the masses. And so that's the idea is they can watch videos three to five minutes long and they can also watch the videos that are specific to the issues that they're having with their dog. And, and so there's thing, there's 18 modules uh, in the entire course, but essentially uh, you, there's like potty training. Like this is, that was one of them. One of that video that was just playing, that was one of the videos that was about the walk. And, oh. and so again, there's like about 200 videos, but you can just get like a hundred of them that are specific. Like there's a puppy one, there's a good to great dog, and then there's a freedom off leash package as well. And so, yeah, it's just DIY videos so that you can watch it anytime you want, whenever it's convenient for you. Because hiring a dog trainer sometimes it's like the schedules don't align or this kind of thing. And some people are like myself, a bit of a slower learner, and you can watch it over and over again and get out there and go and practice. That's that was the idea behind it, and mostly to make training more affordable and people not need to rehome a dog because they can't afford the training. Sure. That's a great program. I, I really love that. And, you know, one of the bullet points says, does your dog embarrass you out <laughs> in public? <laughs> How, I mean, just about everybody, I think we've gone through that process of, especially when you have puppies and the puppy stage is not like human infants. I mean, it's what it ends, what about two, two, three years and they're no longer puppies. It's going to certainly depend upon the breed as it relates to like growth, usually 18 months. Okay. But then the personality will go through phases. Like I, even my own dog, I've noticed a difference in, in him as he's aged. He's like six now. Like before it was a lot of work for me to manage my own dog when people come over. And now he's like kind of lazy about it. Whereas before he was wanting to say hi so badly, he would like whine and all this kind of stuff. Like he had so much energy, so much desire to say hello. And, but even with my own dog, again, I've noticed over the years that things are, are, cha- are changing for sure. And, but the, what people tend to do, I hear this a lot. Well, we're just going to see if they outgrow it, but I'm like, life is too short to struggle with your dog. Yeah. Are you going to wait the five years? And then that's half the dog's life, maybe depending upon the breed. I'm like, not fair to do to yourself or the dog or your family or those that got to be exposed to all the, all the wildness. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You know, speaking about a dog who's aging, I do have a question and this comes from just purely not knowing. So this is really a question for me as your dog grows older and becomes a senior. Mm. Do they still expect you to keep up with the same commands or do they want a break? Hmm. So dogs don't think like that. They don't, they even like, so no dog from my experience is like thinking of the person following through. Like, is my person going to follow through or anything like that? Like the dog is just simply in the now. So the Mm -hmm. dog doesn't care that it was three years old. 
and now it's six or whatever. It doesn't care. The dog is just in the present moment. The dog is just simply what is my current life situation and how do I make it better? So I want to play. I want you to pet me. I want food. I want to go to the bathroom. I want to sleep. That's pretty much it. Like it's, it's, you know, it's very simple. You know, it's so funny. It's like we can make things so much more difficult than they actually need to be (laughs) in trying to over analytically think things through, not realizing that's, I mean, that makes so much sense. Like it's, it's just so much common sense thinking. It is. It really is. It's just so funny. Or, oh no, my dog's, oh no, my dog's jealous. It's like, no, your dog's actually not jealous. It's different. Your dog is being possessive with you. Your dog thinks it owns you just like it owns a toy or a bone right? So then who's the leader? So there's so many things we could talk about for days and days and days. There are so many uh, situations like this where we have this perception until we know something differently. Mm -hmm. And it's Mm -hmm. just like Joseph uh, Campbell's hero's journey about how a movie's created. Once you get exposed to that and you know how it's done, you never see a movie the same way. Well, same thing with dogs. Once I teach you, or once you discover cracking the canine code, you'll never look at your dog the same way, in 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 a beautiful way, because you understand with so much more depth and such a deeper understanding. Oh wow! You don't know what you don't know, and you don't even know that you don't know it, right? (laughs) (laughs) Wow! You know, I mean, you have definitely shown a light for me. I'm not the leader with my dog. I thought I was. He does all of those things to be possessive that you were mentioning. You want to play more on that? Sure. Okay. So how do we, your audience is wondering, well, how do I know if I'm the leader of my dog? Okay. Okay. Let's see. Who eats first when it's dinner time, your dog or yourself? Me. That's great. That's how leaders are in the wild. Who's the, so your dog's outside. You're going to go inside with your dog. Who goes through the door first? I, it's 50, 50. Uh-huh. So sometimes, so that's where the unclear, see how that's unclear communication. This is normal. Everyone is like this too. Mm-hmm. My dog would go through first, but I, most of the time he would, but I don't, he's not allowed to. I go through the door first because I'm guiding and I'm the leader and I didn't make sure it's safe and yada, yada. And, and, and so how about this one? When you, sit down on the couch or you lie down in bed does the dog just invite itself or does it look to you for should it do it he waits for permission that's great that's one way that you reinforce when you're sitting on the couch or lying in bed does your dog whine at you paw at you put its muzzle underneath your hand demand being petted he'll whine so that pushy behavior is not how dogs act when we're the alpha So your dog sometimes honors your leadership role and other times doesn't. So the times in which your dog is being pushy, in your case specifically, Elizabeth, and and everyone else, because many other people experience the same thing, by the way, that you're explaining. Uh, When when the dog is doing that kind of pushy behavior, uh, it's not honoring your leadership. It knows that it accesses things through you. Now, does that mean that, like, dog doesn't get anything? No. My dog sleeps in bed with me. He hangs out on the couch with me. He sits next to me when I meditate. I kiss him all the time. I was working out in the home gym today and I was doing a plank and he comes over and he wants to rest his head on on my head. But I'm like, no, back up. Now I invite you into my space. So because remember, spatial pressure, right, is a thing. So if the dog's always encroaching upon our space and our personal bubble, is that cool? Now, another easy way to look at it, and we're going to start to do, I think we're going to start to do some fun social media skits on it. What if it was me doing those things to you, Elizabeth? Would it be okay? No. Right. But why is it okay with our dog? Or say another family member. Will we allow our daughter, our son, our our significant other to do some of these things? We think they're crazy. But why do we make all these excuses with our dogs? Because they're cute and they're innocent and they're animal and they're not human. Yet we treat them human-like. And so this is what I mean by unclear communication. We're not being consistent. We're not being reliable. We're we're often acting out in a way based upon 
how our day went. And that's not consistent and that doesn't feel reliable to your animal. So wow. you're consistent and reliable and you'll see your relationship start to really change. And it gets deeper. Again, Zeus and I, if I talk about it any longer, I'm gonna start bawling and <laughs> crying from joy and mm -hmm. because the connection is so strong. So I honor him and I give him the things that he wants. However, he doesn't get to decide it, I do. Not to be a control freak, but to honor how canines operate and to bring a lot of peace in, within the home to, to maintain that peace. Man, that visual that you gave me of, you know, would would your guest enter your house before you? Like, oh my gosh, that man, okay. okay. <laughs> that just changed my view just completely 180 on so many things. Right. Wow. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> oh my gosh. Good. That was so kind. Thank you. Well, Ryan, this this has been fantastic. What is the best way for our viewers to follow you? Yeah, so uh, people can reach out on Instagram. I welcome DMs on what resonated or any questions. And so on Instagram, it's really simple. It's at World of Dog Training. Wonderful. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for your time this evening. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was great. Thanks for having me and uh, wishing you well. And thank you to everyone also that tuned in and listened. Thank you. We'll see you again soon. All right. I hope so. Bye -bye. Oh, my goodness. He was fantastic. As always, we are blessed. You are blessed. And I love you. I will see you again very soon. Stay tuned.